wonderful 12 and a half inch reflecting telescope. It is, it's a great one isn't it? It's uh, especially for lunar and planetary astronomy. Uh, quite apt in a way because we have some wonderful lunar and planetary events coming up. Don't we, we do, yes. In particular on the morning of December the 2nd, if you look out into the east you'll see a beautiful grouping of the waning crescent moon, Venus and Saturn just above the two of them. It's gorgeous when you see that lot together they just look fantastic. So that'll be in the east in the early morning sky. That's right and a nice photo opportunity I think. Now on that that night you'll have the moon very close to another bright planet, the planet Jupiter, yes. but that's not the main event we're looking for. On that night the Geminid meteor shower reaches its peak. Wow. Now you'll have to wait because the moon will wash out most of the meteors, so you have to wait until the moon is actually set, so that's just after midnight, but that's ideal because the meteor shower actually goes up to its peak in the early hours of the morning. And Gemini will be quite high in the sky by then as well, it? Won't will, it? so if you go out sort of just after midnight, right the way through until dawn, that's when you'll like to see a Geminid meteor. And the rates are pretty high, sort of 100 to 120 metres an hour. And if you want the moon out of the way, which is obviously what you want, Pete, then <laughs> what about the winter solstice? Quite special this year because oh, it we is, have yeah. total lunar eclipse. I think I'm really looking forward to this, you know, because it starts at around about 5.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, the moon will be about 23 degrees up. Uh, and the, but nothing will really be seen then. It's not until about half past six when the uh, Earth's shadow passes over the moon right. that you'll really start to notice it. And I'm hoping it'll go a lovely sort of dark coppery colour. Uh, that's right, because sometimes they're quite light, sometimes they're very dark. They are, so you think it's going to go dark? I, I hope so. They're my favourite ones, the well, dark copper ones. I'll have to take the opposite stance then, and I'll say it'll be light. And of course, well, in the event, it'll be cloudy and none of us will see it. <laughs> but what about January the 4th? We are going to be mightily busy then, aren't we? That's going to be a manic day, astronomically. I mean, it'll start off, actually, on the night of the 3rd of January, heading into the 4th of January, because then we've got another meteor shower. That's the Quadrantids. And I always thought this wasn't a very active shower, but that's not true at all, oh, is it's, it? It's, it it can be very active. I mean, you can get rates equivalent to the Geminids up to 100 or that's 120 meters an hour. The radiant position, that's the, the point in the sky where the meteors appear to come from, isn't as well placed as it is with the Geminids. So that right. actually knocks down the number of meters you see. I see. But the peak occurs in a very, very short time span. Right. So if you're up as you're approaching dawn on the 4th of January, that's when you're likely to see the peak of the quadrant. So it's very, very narrow view then to catch this. You have yes. to be uh, quite quick to catch it. And wrap up one, of course, it'll be very cold. It should be very cold. But yeah. on that morning, of course, we have a partial eclipse of the sun. Ah, yes. More than half of it's coming, I think. Uh, it's a fairly big chunk of uh, the sun which will be partially eclipsed by the moon as the sun is rising. So that'd be a wonderful sight. It'd be very strange. I don't think I've ever seen that, actually. And obviously, if you're planning to look, you need to use dark glasses. Of course, as the sun rises in height above the horizon, mm. so its light gets more intense Absolutely. anyway. So you have to be very careful. But the, it depends where you are in the country. If you're in the southern part of the country, the sun is rising at about 10 past 8 in the morning. So about 60% of it would be obscured by that. That's right. But if you're in the north of the country, it's a bit later, so it's about half past 8-ish. But it's certainly a substantial part of the sun will be, going, be quite noticeable, won't it? It will indeed, yeah. But the eclipse will be over for everybody by about half past 9. So. But on the night of January the 4th, we have an interesting thing with Jupiter and Uranus. Uh, Jupiter and Uranus have been very close, haven't they, for the past few months? They've been, actually, it's Jupiter's been moving backwards and forwards and getting quite close to Uranus. Uh, this gets very close, doesn't it, on the night of the 4th? It does. Jupiter, which is mm -hmm. easy to find, it's that really bright yes, yeah. planet you can see towards the southwest as the night's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look for Jupiter, find it in a pair of binoculars, and then that star you can see just above it on the night of the 4th. Just to the north of Jupiter. Just to the north of mm. Jupiter is Uranus. Now, it will be quite close so for several days either side of that, but after Jupiter moves away later mm. on in January, that's it until 2024. So really ought to make <laughs> the most of it then. Yeah, definitely. Well, there's lots to see in the sky. On to our news notes now. I'm with Chris North. And first of all, we had a flyby of the smallest comet, also of the largest asteroid yet passed, Lutetia. Yes, this was a flyby of the Rosetta spacecraft past the asteroid Lutetia. As you say, it's the largest asteroid uh, we've flown past to date. It's about 70 miles across, so it's, it's a big beast. Uh, and it flew past at a similar distance to the Hartley 2 flyby, about mm. 500 miles away. Um, and it means we get a resolution on this asteroid of about 60 metres. And you can yeah. see boulders, large boulders, but boulders. One of the results from the uh, Rosetta flyby 
is that the asteroid is covered by a 600 meter thick layer of, of du asteroid dust, essentially. Not, not too dissimilar to, to moon dust, if you like, but 600 yes. meters thick, so, so very thick indeed. If you look at some of the craters, they, they actually look very shallow, almost as like they are filled with this dust. You can see the boulders dotted around, okay. and, and then is that evidence possibly in the center for a, a little dust slide mm, down the bottom? Could well be, I think. Because the next asteroid to be studied in detail, not quite yet, is Vesta number four. That's, that's quite a different kind of body. Yes, the Dawn spacecraft is going to go yeah. into orbit around Vesta next year. And we've had some new images of it from the, the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's actually looked at Vesta at several rotation angles and they've been able to construct a, a movie of Vesta rotating. So they can try and plan what Dawn will do when it gets there, to get a heads up about what the asteroid looks like, where the interesting features are and so on. Well, um, our last news note tonight is, um, is your province. It's um, way beyond the solar system. The results from the new Herschel telescope. The image that we've got here is a, an image that's four degrees across, so it's eight times the size of the full moon. There's about 6,000 galaxies in there, most of them seen as they were billions of years ago. And there were five galaxies that, when this image was studied, looked quite peculiar. They were very red and, and very bright. Now, this is a far infrared image, so it's looking at dust and gas in these galaxies. And these galaxies that were particularly bright were, were possibly thought to be gravitational lenses. So they studied them in, in more detail and they found they in fact were. So what's happening is that when you look in optical light with something like the Keck telescope, you see a foreground yes, galaxy. Yeah. And the, the mass of that galaxy is actually bending the light from a much, much more distant galaxy behind. And that distant galaxy is what, what Herschel's seeing. Now what this allows us to do is study these very distant galaxies, seeing as they were 11 billion years ago, so when the universe was at a third of its current age, you can't see them in optical light because they're so shrouded in dust and essentially yeah. invisible to optical, to optical telescopes. But in far infrared light, we can study them in much more detail and get a bet better picture of how galaxies, relatively normal galaxies, were evolving uh, in the very early universe. Chris, thank you very much. Please don't forget to send in your questions for our 700th Sky at Night programme and send them into bbc.co.uk forward slash sky at night. And when we come back next month, I'll be talking about the great bear in the sky. So until then, good night. <laughs>